Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we're talking about Canadian foreign policy and a new film series that is available to watch for free at truthtothepowerless.com. Our guest, Pitasana Shane Magutas, I, I'm going to mess up your name. I'm sorry, Pitta, but I'll call you Pitta, uh, has a master's degree in global affairs from the University of Toronto's Monk School of Global Affairs. He has worked in multiple organizations advocating for peace and disarmament, such as Save the Children, Science for Peace, Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, and Stand Canada. While completing his postgraduate education at the University of Toronto, Pitasana decided to embark on a three-year documentary journey starting in 2019 to explore the role of Canada's foreign policy in the international arena. Uh, Pitasana, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you for having me, David. It's an honor to be here. Uh, thanks for making this film series, uh, which, again, people can watch at truthtothepowerless.com. There are, I, I see six episodes. I've just now watched the first two, and I'm eager to watch the other four. Are there, are there going to be more? Is the sixth one the last one? The, the sixth one is the last one. It's, uh, we wanted to have, like, uh, uh, a docu series that shows, you know, critical parts of Canada's foreign policy that's uh, that's not, uh, uh, you know, informed, uh, you know, to citizens within the mainstream media. We want to cover all the major elements like the militarism, the fact that, you know, Canada's foreign policy involves uh, overthrowing democratic elected leaders, and you know, we want to touch on issues like Israel, Palestine, and so many multifaceted issues. But we want to touch on the main core components, but there's just layers and layers of Canada's foreign policy that we just didn't cover, which would involve like 30 episodes to cover. <laughs> or oh, 3,000. Uh, yeah, but it, I, I think it does, uh, what I've seen, does a tremendous job of opening people's eyes who don't know much about Canadian foreign policy or think they do, but it's all wrong. Uh, and you provide and you interview numerous important speakers and then provide information about them on the website. So I think people can start learning more. Uh, this can be an entryway to to learning a lot more. Right. Yeah. And I mean, what's unique about what we've done is that uh, we not only interview activists and academics challenging Candace foreign policy, but we also interview the politicians, the diplomats, ambassadors, uh, you know, ministers uh, who are in government responsible for formulating, cha you know, and championing these so-called benevolent and well-intentioned foreign policies. So we interview them. And then we interview academics and, ac and activists that are challenging that foreign policy. So you really get both sides. The viewer gets both sides of every issue. Uh, absolutely. One of, what brings to mind one of the more interesting parts for me. Uh, you, you asked a former uh, Canadian ambassador to Saudi Arabia uh, to justify selling all these weapons to Saudi Arabia which he claims is, you know, is good for the Canadian economy. So who cares? Uh, but you actually in the film debunk that uh, it's not actually good for the Canadian economy, but I, I, I would like the whole notion of only selling weapons to those countries that won't abuse human rights with them to be challenged a little bit more. How, how do you use weapons of murder without violating people's human rights? I've never understood that one. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, you know, when we interview the ambassador, Canada's ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Dennis Horak, uh, you know, he says, you know, we, 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 you know, we, we ask him, you know, there's these credible allegations uh, that arms Canada sold to Saudi Arabia have been used by Saudi Arabia in their assault on Yemen, violating human rights. And he just kind of says, well, does Canada want an arms industry or don't we? You know, he, he's saying that the Canadian arms industry, it provides, it's lucrative, provides Canadians a lot of jobs. And then, you know, when the, we counter that by interviewing a, an activist, Richard Sanders, he's part of the coalition to oppose the arms trade. And uh, he says, well, 
you can actually create more jobs. The government can create more jobs if we invest in the public sector and infrastructure and healthcare. You can create more jobs that way. And we put the statistics to prove that. And then we also, uh, you know, show that these so-called uh, arms controls that the Canadian government has, where you know they say we're doing our due diligence to ensure that you know these arms are not being used by human rights violators. These, they you know, we expose that these arms controls, uh, you know, uh, provisions are like weasel words, you know, they, they don't have any substance in them. And basically anybody, and you could just sell arms to any human rights violator. And uh, so there's no meaning behind it. We kind of show that. Yeah, no, it's very, very well done. I just, uh, I just want people to go another little teeny step and, and and question how you could sell the weapons to Sweden instead of Saudi Arabia and have weapons of murder used in a way that didn't violate anyone's human rights. Uh, it's 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 actually not possible. Um, but it, the 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 quote that the, the the truth to the powerless name for the film comes from a, a Chomsky quote, and Noam Chomsky is featured uh, considerably in the films, uh, much to their benefit. Um, can you explain uh, what the idea is in the name of the film? Yeah, that that's right. So in the very first scene of the docu series, uh, Noam Chomsky is looking right into the camera, and he's saying uh, the people in power they already know what the truth is it's the powerless that don't it's the powerless that that don't know what the truth is so we have an obligation a duty to you know inform and educate the the powerless the regular the, the citizenry so that they can then become informed and they can then challenge those who are in power the powerful like henry kissinger they already know the atrocities that they've committed you know they already know the truth they already know that you know the egregious nature it's the it's the citizenry the average people that don't so that that was the whole idea and so when we interview these 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 politicians you know uh w w the assumption was that they know what they're saying is uh you know uh is rubbish and it's the it's the uh you know the regular average citizen that doesn't so we want to get that you know you know the establishment perspective mm -hmm as well as the, uh, you know, activists and academics perspective. Later, I, I kind of uh, changed my mind about that because I found out that the politicians, a number of them genuinely believed what they were saying to be the truth. So when we interviewed uh, uh, Bill Graham, who was the Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs during the time that Canada intervened to oust uh, Jean Bertrand Aristide, Haiti's first democratically elected leader, when I was interviewing him, he genuinely believed Aristide was a dictator, a thug, and we did a good thing by ousting him from power. He had such genuine conviction that it really made me question this belief as to whether or not the powerful actually know the truth. Maybe they believe everything they're saying, you know, so that, that it was it was a real, you know, challenge for me because I that's how we came out with this with this doc. You know, when I first started, we we're like, okay, the powerful they already know the truth. They know everything they're saying is rubbish, but we. I kind of later began questioning this entire belief that I had. Well, I, I think it's a very interesting investigation, and I think the answer is probably more complicated than yes or no uh, in terms of do the powerful always know their line. Um, but uh, you you were educated in Canada and not just in primary school and high school, but at the University of Toronto Monk School of Global Affairs. Uh, and you didn't learn much uh, about, I mean, you interview ordinary people on the street in the film and they seem as clueless about what the Canadian government is doing as people would have been about the US government if you interviewed them in the United States. Did you, what, what did you learn uh, in Canada's education system? Did you learn more than the average person on the street or did you learn a bunch of things that were actually, you know, worse than nothing? <laughs> what, what were you I, I, taught? I felt that uh, the Canadian education system it 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 more or less p uh, paints a glorified picture of Canada. So you you learn about how, uh, for instance, Lester B. Pearson, Canada's former prime minister, he's this great peacekeeper, and he you know, introduced peacekeeping to the world as a result of the Suez Crisis and what he did to defuse that situation. He won he wins the Nobel Peace Prize, but what you don't learn is that Lester B. Pearson was a strong proponent of the Vietnam War. Canada uh, in, uh, 
was acting as an asset to the United States by sending bombing threats uh, in, uh, in its position in the International Controls Commission, sending bombing threats to North Vietnam. Uh, you know, Kanda was, uh, 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 Lester B. Pearson was advising Linda B. Johnson to use cluster bombs in, its, in, in the United States assault on uh, North Vietnam, Lester B. Pearson was instrumental in, uh, uh, in creating and uh, partitioning Palestine, dispossessing uh, hundreds, uh, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians and creating the state of Israel in, in uh, 1948. So uh, you don't learn about that. You just learn about Lester B. Pearson, the peacekeeper, you know, to the extent that we are taught anything critical about Canada's history, it's the fact that Canada, uh, we brutally and uh, uh, in, inhumanely treated the indigenous population. That's the extent to which you learn anything critical about Canada's history in school. And that was the case for me even in grad school. But what you don't learn is, for instance, how, as we expose in this docuseries, how during the apartheid, South African apartheid era, uh, apartheid officials came to Canada they looked at our indigenous reserve system. They looked at our residential school system. Our residential schools are basically where indigenous children were forcibly taken away from their uh, mothers and fathers by the Canadian government. They were housed in these schools where they had their, uh, their culture, their religion, their language, uh, their customs completely wiped out. They had Christianity imposed on them. And this was the model which white South African officials were looking at, which they would then take back with them to South Africa and, and implement in uh, their apartheid systems in their Bantu stance to segregate the black majority population. You don't learn about that. You don't learn about how Canada was supporting uh, uh, South African apartheid right up until almost the very end. Uh, we're speaking with Pitasana Shane Maguthas, whose film you can watch at truthtothepowerless.com. Uh, Pitta, even, even more scandalous, perhaps, to the ordinary viewer in Canada than connections to South Africa might be connections to Nazi Germany, uh, at least in the United States. This is the least acceptable thing to talk about, the Nazis having learned segregation systems in the United States uh, for segregating Jews in their society. But in these films, you cover the relationship between Canada's prime minister and, and Hitler, the refusal to admit refugees, the, the support for the Nazis up until the war against them. Can you, can you talk about what you learned and what you present there? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, Canada's prime minister at the time, William uh, Mackenzie King, he was uh, extremely anti-Semitic. He was uh, he visited Hitler in Nazi Germany, and he said Hitler's like Joan of Arc. What he's doing in uh, uh, for Germany and for Europe is a is a great thing. Uh, Canada had a policy uh, uh, called "None is too many" with respect to admitting Jews into the country. None. Is too many. That was the policy the Canadian government had, and uh, uh, we had uh, supported fascist forces. We 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 we'd, we'd uh, provided justification for Japan's assault on Manchuria. Uh, uh, we had, uh, the, and the primary reason that's exposed, we exposed in the documentary is why Canada supported uh, Hitler is because Hitler was uh, oppressing uh, left wing uh, communist uh, uh, forces. Uh, that the West strongly opposed. So because Hitler was doing that, Hitler was doing a service to the West and the United States, uh, you know, primarily viewed Hitler as a, uh, a, an accommodating figure in this regard. It was weakening the influence of the Russians. So Hitler was okay in our books until, of course, he wasn't. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and and Canada, I, I mean, through this history and up till today, like the United States and in partnership with the United States, has supported dictatorships and coups, including in, in Latin America, has actually supported the Monroe Doctrine, even though Monroe wanted to take over Canada. Doesn't matter. And, and has been, I think, a leading country in trying to overthrow Venezuela just in recent years 
years, hasn't it? Yeah, and uh, we talk about Venezuela as well uh, it, um, in uh, episode six of our of our docu series, and how Canada has been a a leading proponent of uh, the Lima Group. The Lima Group was created, uh, you know, by the West, really. Canada being a member, and it was created uh, under the guise of a peaceful transition, a political transition, uh, to uh, as a result of the economic uh, hardships that have been created in Venezuela. Uh, so it was. So the Lima Group had supported uh, Juan Guaido, and uh, had been trying to oust Nicolas Maduro from power, and the. The Lima Group has been largely unsuccessful in this. Juan Guaido has, you know, uh, he was opposition members just recently had uh, voted him out of uh, his his role as the so-called, you know, interim, uh, the the alternate leader of Venezuela. The Lima Group has largely failed members within the Lima Group. Like Peru had, you know, uh, criticized <laughs> the Lima Group, had wanted to withdraw from the Lima Group. So, uh, you know, Canada has been largely unsuccessful in its backing of Juan Guaido. And, you know, uh, now we see with the crisis in Ukraine, countries like France are kind of looking to Venezuela uh, as a source for oil. So, you know, it's been, it's been a large failure, you know, and the reason why Canada supports Juan Guaido is because uh, Nicolas Maduro, he wants to use the resources of Venezuela to benefit the people, whereas Canada wants to, uh, you know, bring in its its uh, its foreign corporations to exploit the resources of Venezuela, you know, significant oil resources. And Nicolas Maduro does not want that because it does not benefit the people of his country. Uh, absolutely right. Um, Pitta, the, the role Canada has played uh, in in U.S. war making uh, and in international abuse of poorer countries uh, comes out in these in these episodes. Uh, I mean, a leading role in creating NATO and in creating the policies of the IMF and the World Bank in punishing poor and indebted nations. How does how, how does Canada manage to maintain a, an image as a, a, a benevolent force in in the world? I mean, do you? Do you think I, it, most Canadian peace activists I talk to think that Canada, the Canadian government, has has tricked the Canadian people more than the U.S. government has tricked the U.S. people? That the U.S. people are actually more aware of what the U.S. government does around the world than the Canadians are? Is is, is that accurate? Do you think? I, I, you know, that's a that's a justification that uh, uh, you know people. Uh, certainly that I've met, Canadians I've met, they kind of dismiss Canada's foreign policy of just us being like, you know, we're just puppets of the United States and that's and that's it. But I think that's a mistake because uh, Canada's foreign policy is much more significant. It's much more nuanced than that. So <clears throat> Canada is able to, I think uh, it's largely because we have uh, really good PR, I guess, <laughs> but it's uh, we're able to have this benevolent image and this benevolent global image allows us to then uh, do very heinous things covertly for the United States. So, for instance, Canada, as we have exposed in this uh, in our docu series, Canada actually uh, played a significant role in the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Publicly, you know, Canada was said that we oppose the invasion. Jean Chrétien, Canada's prime minister at the time, said that. Oh, you know, we oppose the uh, invasion of Iraq because there's no UN Security Council resolution. Privately, Canada was supplying arms uh, uh, to the United States. Canadian generals were coordinating, working with the United States to coordinate assaults, uh, airstrikes on Iraq in the 2003 invasion of, of uh, military jets coming from the United States, we're going through Canadian airspace en route to bomb Iraq. So we were providing air support. We were, we were providing all these forms of crucial support behind the scenes. And Canadian officials were actually bragging privately to, to the U.S., look, we're doing so much for you. Outside of the coalition of the willing, we're doing the most than any other country, any other country is doing, but we're doing this covertly while maintaining our image as this peacekeeping nation. So I think to just dismiss Canada, 
as being a puppet of the United States. And, and you know, Canada, if it wanted to, it could take an independent stance. It could take an independent streak on a number of issues. So, for instance, we talk about how in the docuseries, Canadian mining companies, uh, Canadian mining companies, they, uh, they pollute and they devastate uh, Latin America. They... Uh, uh, Canadian uh, mining uh, companies, uh, security forces rape uh, villagers in uh, in various uh, countries that uh, they they loot and exploit. Canada's not doing this because of the United States. Canada's doing this. Canada's allowing Canadian mining companies to commit such atrocities because it's lucrative. It's very beneficial. Canada's selling arms to Saudi Arabia not because the United States is saying so. It's because it's very lucrative to sell arms to Saudi Arabia. They pay a lot of money for that. So, you know, Canada is not uh, voting against resolutions that are uh, supported by over 100 countries annually criticizing Israel's uh, building of settlements. Canada's not doing that because the United States is saying so. Canada's doing that because we're a settler colonial nation that was founded on expelling uh, 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 subjugating our indigenous population. Israel is a settler colonial country that was founded on expelling and subjugating its indigenous population. We have a bond there. So that's why we back Israel. So it's not because the United States is saying so. So to simply dismiss Canada as a puppet of the United States does a grave injustice to the actual history of what Canada's foreign policy is all about. I imagine Israel also buys weapons from Canada as it does That's from right. the United States. Uh, well, it's given them by the United States. Um, but there is a, Canada is a significant weapons dealer. But, but isn't there something halfway good about the hypocrisy about Canada having to pretend it's not a part of a U.S. war, pretend that its government opposed the Vietnam War? I mean, isn't that sort of a halfway positive step that we aren't even at in the, I, I know, Joe Biden lied that he opposed the Iraq war, but it took him years and years before he even would do that. Uh, is, isn't this a sign of maybe moving in the right direction? Uh, I think it's a it's a sign of our, our deception uh, that we're just able to cleverly deceive the public that we're not actually fully involved in all these atrocities. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, we're providing crucial support to, you know, the Vietnam War, crucial support to the Iraq War, you know, uh, we're providing crucial support in all these areas. You know, we, we were out front on many instances. We document Canada's involvement in NATO, as you had mentioned earlier, in, Af in Afghanistan, in Yugoslavia, in Libya. We interview the relevant politicians there. In that case, we were out front and we were hawkish. And, you know, Canada actually took a lead role in Libya. And if you look at the catastrophe there, but there's no public, uh, there's no uh, really condemnation of uh, the ministers, of the military generals in Canada that were just responsible for this horrendous assault on Libya that's created a slave trade, that's created all these atrocities, you know, and I think the fact that Canada does not receive censorship domestically is a, is a result of the Canadian media, which is strongly, as we, as we document in, the, in our docuseries, the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, is strongly allied with the prime minister, the prime minister is responsible for appointing the head of the CBC. So the prime minister will appoint whoever will conform to the views and the agendas of uh, the Canadian government. So that's one main reason why you don't really see uh, uh, censorship, criticism, sorry, criticism within the mainstream Canadian media. It's because the mainstream Canadian media is largely influenced by the Canadian government. It's, it's tempting in the U.S. to imagine public media like the CBC as a solution. But if it's not independent uh, public media that can say what it wants, uh, maybe it's not a solution. Uh, you, you also you you show Prime Minister Trudeau talking about, you know, burning huge quantities of fossil fuels sustainably, which, of course, doesn't exist. It's an oxymoron. But. The oxymoron that concerns me the most, and I don't know how much you go into this, is is the idea of armed peacekeeping, uh, which Canada is so proud of. Uh, and I, I, I the, the record seems very clear that unarmed peacekeeping works better, that there's actually a problem with the whole idea of armed 
peacekeeping. What do you what do you think of that? Because this is this is, I think, the pride of many Canadians that we use the military, but we use it as the leading United Nations peacekeepers around the world. Yeah, I mean, uh, and as I'm sure you're well aware, United you know Nations peacekeeping forces have committed grave atrocities in Haiti. You know, uh, we we you know Canada played a significant role there because we're we're a francophone country. We speak French, so we played a lead role in Haiti. So uh, in Haiti, after Canada played a role a significant role in ousting the democratic leader, Jean Bertrand Aristide, the Canadian uh, UN peacekeeping troops, Canadians were part of this. We came into the, we came into the capital, committed grave atrocities against the Haitian people, uh, you know, rape, just horrendous atrocities. You know, there was a later years later, there was a cholera outbreak that was directly related to UN peacekeeping forces being there. Uh, so just, massive atrocities and this was done under the guise of peacekeeping we're going into haiti the u.n troops are going into haiti to uh, to you know uh to calm the unrest that, uh, that was created by this thug jean bertrand aristide democratic elected supported by 90 percent of the population so that's the narrative of peacekeeping and we looked at another extreme case in the case of yugoslavia where uh, in the nato bombing canada we said that you know Canada, the NATO ally, said that this is a humanitarian mission. Well, the Canadian ambassador to Yugoslavia, the former ambassador, James Bissett, we interviewed, he says, how are you going to have a humanitarian mission by bombing the country for 78 days and nights? Where's the humanitarianism? So that's just this duplicity about this humanitarianism, peacekeeping, but then this violent, brutal assault that we inflict under the guise of peacekeeping. Uh, excellent question he asks there. Um, it, the film we're talking about, by the way, is available free. Six episodes you can go watch at truthtothepowerless.com and you can contribute to the funding that's needed, actually, to produce the films there by making a, a donation. Uh, Peter, we've got a, just one minute left. Uh, what's the response been thus far and how's it going with, with showing this around? The response has been overwhelmingly positive. A lot of people have uh, praised their docuseries as being uh, something that they have never heard before, that they don't see in the mainstream. They, they, you know, they believe that it should be taught in the high schools and you know, schools throughout the country. So it's been overwhelmingly positive. I couldn't agree more. I hope it is shown in every school in Canada and beyond. It wouldn't hurt for people in the United States to see it as well uh, and elsewhere. We've been speaking with Pitasana Shanmaguthas, whose film you can watch at truthtothepowerless.com. Pitta, thank you very much for doing this and for coming on Talk World Radio. Thanks again for having me, David. It's been a pleasure. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.